What's up, heathens? How y'all do? Tonight, we're going over some more Flat Earth stuff. I hope that you guys are uh, prepared. I hope you got your butt holders a holding because we're going over some moon facts with Eric Dubay. The sun and moon appear to be the same size because they are the same size. Mainstream science wants you to believe that the reason the sun and moon look like the same size is because the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon and 400 times farther away. They say that this is just a coincidence, but that is their way of trying to explain why they appear to be similar sizes. It is fairly obvious that the sun and moon are both circling overhead. And that's always the greatest thing to do is go over moon facts with Eric. Uh, a lot of people like to claim a lot of things about the flat earth and Eric DeBay is not only going to contradict himself but also a lot of other flat earthers tonight. So tonight we are discussing more the moonlight basically. We have the first one that's about is moonlight just reflection of the sun's light? The answer to that is yes. Before we even start, the sun's light is reflected off of the moon and is shown on the earth. That tends to reduce the light down to about 10-15%. And so the intensity is not all that much, but also any kind of uh, heat, there's not much heat that's actually transferred to the earth in that way. At least not in any kind of significant way. If I'm wrong about that, let me know. I always want to be corrected. Oh, the ominous music. I love it. The light of the moon is totally different than that of the sun. The effects it has on plants and food is different, and even the temperature is different. In the sunlight, the shade is always cooler than the sunlight itself. Right. However, in the moonlight, it is cooler, while in the shade, it is warmer. I get how he doesn't really understand. For one thing, though, basically, while the sun's out during the day, you have materials that are soaking up that heat and releasing it back out at the same time. During the day, though, like it keeps getting, it keeps soaking up all that heat and that energy. So when the sun goes down and night comes out, you have energy being released slowly from like the ground. In this particular thing right here, you would have like whatever table he's on would be releasing some kind of energy or heat that tap would be like everything around there is going to be releasing some kind of energy out into the, the atmosphere or into the world. The way that he's got his experiment set up, it would be hotter underneath it because of the fact that that heat is getting trapped underneath whatever he's using to shield from the moon. This even happens because of like clouds. If you have a really cloudy night uh, and, and you had a really hot day, chances are you're going to have kind of a really hot and stuffy night. That happens sometimes during, you know, the summer or whatnot but clouds can even affect that too. Eric is wrong here in that he thinks that the, the moonlight has a cooling effect. Like for some reason, the light doesn't heat stuff up. It cools it down. For some, I don't know. I don't know exactly why he thinks that, but it, he thinks that this experiment is flawed because he doesn't account for all the factors. The moonlight couldn't be reflecting the sun's light because then it would have the same effects in temperature, but it appears the moon is emitting its own light and is translucent. The phases are a function of the moon, and it is not a spherical ball of rock reflecting sunlight as we are told. And he's not going to have any evidence to back up the whole idea that it's not a spherical rock orbiting the Earth. He's not going to have anything to suggest that. He's not going to provide any kind of evidence to say that the moon even gives off its own light. But rather is a transparent, self-luminous disk. If the moon were a sphere, then we should be able to see the other side along with different faces, yet we see only one side. Not only that, but many people have taken images of the moon with stars being seen through it, and in the afternoon, you can see the blue sky right through the moon. Okay, so you can't see stars through the moon. I do know that it's not just some kind of like internal function of the moon, these phases or whatnot uh, that it goes through. It's actually just the way that the earth is positioned in the night sky. We see uh, different phases of the moon and the sun's light shines on it in not exactly different ways, but it, just the position of the moon in the orbit around the earth has it reflecting just a, a certain amount 
mount of the moon. You can't see stars through it, although he may think that the edge of the moon is a lot farther away, maybe. Maybe that, I mean, that would be a reason why he could see the stars when he thinks that they should be covered up. Uh, right here, he's saying that you can see the sky through it or something like that. You're looking through the atmosphere at it, and also the, the whole blueness or whatnot is caused by the way that the sun passes through our atmosphere and, and projects light in, in the different spectrum. And we see the blue spectrum. It just feels like he's pulling shit out of his ass at this point. He doesn't have anything to prove what he's saying here. Just look at these Muslim and Freemasonic depictions of the moon with the stars shining through it. Okay, so are you seriously telling me right now that you're using like symbols, like Freemasonic symbols and Islamic symbols to prove that the, that you can see stars through the moon? Those are artistic depictions of shit. It's not a literal drawing of it. Why do the sun and moon appear to be the same size? The sun and moon appear to be the same size because they are the same size. Mainstream science wants you to believe that the reason the sun and moon look like the same size is because the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon and 400 times farther away. Well, I mean, that that's true. I mean, it's not exactly 400 times or whatnot. I mean, it, it, it's a little bit technically under that. But still, that, that our perspective and how big the moon is and how far it is away from the Earth and how far the sun is away is the reason why they look about the same. But even even the sun, the sun and the moon do change size at different times of the year because of their position in their orbit. Well, OK, so th not the sun, not that the sun has an orbit. We have a position in our orbit that changes the size that we perceive the sun to be. The moon's orbit changes, so we see a change in its size. That's why there is a super moon where it gets really big in the sky. We see changes in it. It's not the same all the time. And actually, thousands and millions of years out, we will cease to be able to actually have a full eclipse. It, it'll, it'll only be the kind of eclipse where it, it doesn't completely block out the sun. The corona. You won't be able to see the corona, that's right. They say that this is just a coincidence, but that is their way of trying to explain why they appear to be similar sizes. It is fairly obvious that the sun and moon are both circling overhead and are both equally balanced opposites and are the same size. Whoa, 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 they're equally balanced opposites? Then how do you explain eclipses? I'm kind of curious. Because it does seem like you're adhering to that model that you have prior in, in the video. Oh, 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 fuck. I, they're going to answer. He's going to answer it right now. What about eclipses? Let's fucking figure this shit out, shall we? Many skeptics like to use eclipses as proof of a globular Earth because of the round shadow that is cast upon the lunar surface. They claim that the sun, Earth, and moon align in a perfect 180 degree syzygy with the sun casting Earth's shadow on the moon. Okay, well, yes, that would make sense that on occasion it would do that. This would make sense on a globe Earth model. I mean, shit works out for that, so I don't understand this problem. The only problem with this unproven theory is that over 50 times in the past 2,000 years, there have been lunar eclipses where the sun is still in the sky as the shadow is being cast upon the moon. Uh, okay, what? This is one of those imbecile moments, I feel, and I should definitely call you a moron in the pure psychological sense. Because at this point, you're saying you're convoluting a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. And apparently a solar eclipse can't happen is what you're saying. Actually, he's talking about a selenillion eclipse. This is an eclipse that occurs rarely when certain conditions are met. Due to the curvature of the Earth during a selenillion, you can see the sun as well as the eclipsing moon. The sun's light rays bend with the curvature of the Earth, allowing you to see the sun and the lunar eclipse at the same time. Although, I do want to note that Eric is a little disingenuous in how he has brought up this subject. Because, as you will tell, I thought that he was trying to suggest that solar eclipses do not work on a globe Earth, but in fact, he is talking about a selenillion. The Illuminati, don't pay attention to this shit we have on screen. Just pay, don't listen to the truth that he's speaking. 
Don't listen to this shit. This makes their theory impossible because the sun would be behind the ball earth in a straight line with the earth and moon, making it the only way for the earth's round shadow to be cast on the moon. No, the moon is a spherical object and it moves in front of the goddamn sun and it blocks out the sun. I don't know how else to explain it. However, in many eclipses, you can see the sun in the sky at the same time as the moon. Because it's a solar eclipse! So the angle of the 180 degree syzygy is not the case, and the round shadow on the moon couldn't possibly be from the Earth. Yes, it can during a lunar eclipse. The shadow is cast upon the Earth from the moon fucking blocking the sun during a solar eclipse. How is this guy this moronic? The ancients had their own explanation for this, known as Rahu, or the Black Sun, which is a third celestial body we are not told about that eclipses the sun and moon and is the same size. Ancient cultures described Rahu as a dark body and that it is what caused eclipses, not the Earth's shadow. Okay, uh, so Michelle says it's all about the angle the moon's dangle. They legit think that a third celestial body or so, uh, some planetoid descends upon the Earth, blocks out the moon and the sun, and then disappears. Basically, aliens come for a vacation every once in a while, and then they fucking leave within, like, a few minutes. It's the aliens and the hollow moon. I figured, fuck them. Whether it is actually Rahu causing eclipses, I feel we need more evidence. But this was the explanation the ancients had for eclipses. Yeah, because they didn't understand what an eclipse was. They didn't understand how the moon orbits around the Earth, and then it passes in fucking front of the sun to create a solar eclipse. And then it, when it orbits around the Earth, and the Earth comes in between the sun and the moon, you have a lunar eclipse. They didn't understand this, so they made up some fucking black god that was in the sky to hide their balls. Gravity was originally thought of by Freemason Sir Isaac Newton, who claimed that instead of objects falling due to density, rather they fell due to a mystical pulling force in which a smaller object can be pulled or attracted to a bigger object. Of course, gravity can be observed nowhere in nature, and scientists claim to have recently discovered gravitational waves, yet they still can't even prove it with experiments. Gravity also seems to be fickle and selective, and not only is it a force that pulls objects to the center of the spinning ball Earth, but it is also a force that allows heavenly bodies such as planets to orbit around bigger bodies. Uh, he, he, he's casting a lot of doubt on the gravity thing. Of course, yes, uh, Sir Isaac Newton is the one that was able to describe it scientifically. Um, we have mathematical formulas that explain it. And the reason why we can't, like, things orbit around massive stars like our sun is because they get into an orbital path and they keep falling towards the sun, but it falls at such a slow rate that it misses it and it comes back around. The sun's gravitational pull, we're not so close to it that we get pulled into the sun, obviously. We're in an orbital path that allows us to sort of continuously free fall, but see, we, we miss the sun. That's why it's not a perfect spherical path, uh, orbits. Orbits are generally elongated into ellipses. So just because Eric DeBay doesn't know how orbits work or how gravity works, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It, that a force can be strong enough to hold oceans, buildings, and people stuck to the earth, yet just weak enough to allow bugs, birds, and planes to fly freely in every direction. It's not like a bird can fly out of the atmosphere. They're still subjected to gravity. I mean, the whole fact that we can't just float up and go anywhere is evidence against this notion that gravity doesn't exist. The fact that the bird has to continuously flap its wings and actually navigate through the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere is evidence of, you know, gravity. And yes, water is held onto the earth by gravity. It's because we're so close to the center of the gravity for the earth that we are pulled onto it. How is it that gravity can keep the oceans from flying off into space? But weak enough not to sink a sailboat well because at that point we're all kind of relatively the same distance from the center of the earth which would be the place where gravity is strongest uh, on the earth we're, we're all relatively at the same spot 
if uh, this guy was kayaking way up high, he would still be up there because of the buoyancy and the fact that he's on top of the water, he's being pulled down or whatnot. If, if we were someplace else, I mean, I, I guess maybe it could sink depending on what the fluid is. Still, it doesn't sink because the same force of gravity that's holding the water on is the same force of gravity that is holding the canoe there. At that point, I mean, buoyancy takes over. We are also told that gravity is what allows moons to orbit planets and planets to orbit around stars. Either gravity should cause people to stick to the Earth, or it should cause people to orbit the Earth. It should either allow the moons and planets to crash into the sun, or it should cause planets and moons to orbit the sun. Both functions are clearly different. The natural world around us was explained by the laws of density and buoyancy, in which objects fell due to being denser than the air surrounding it or being less dense than the air surrounding it. Oh God. He's throwing in this whole buoyancy idea because some things are more dense, they fall down and less dense things float up. Now, while this is true, they are still both subjected to gravity and gravity is the thing that makes it go down or go up. If you had a completely uh, a space completely void of any gravitational forces, it wouldn't go anywhere because it doesn't have any forces acting on it. It doesn't just immediately fall down. I need to know on the flat earth model, what force is actually making it go down because it's not just buoyancy because you need a force to act upon it in order for it to go either direction. So it rises like a helium balloon. Density and buoyancy are the only reasons why objects fall or rise, and gravity can be found nowhere in the natural world. And it's found everywhere in the fucking natural world. It's it's everywhere. It's fucking this Illuminati thing. Boom, it fell because of fucking gravity. It's everywhere, motherfucker. Come to the dark side.